everyone. Uh, today we will be conducting an interview featuring issues that concern transgender individuals. The resource person for today's interview is Professor uh, uh, Prabhasiri Ginige. She is also a consultant psychiatrist. Professor Ginige is a senior lecturer at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Peradeniya and an honorary consultant psychiatrist at the teaching hospital Peradeniya. Professor Ginige is a fellow of the prestigious Sri Lanka College of Psychiatrists. Professor Pabasari Ginige is also a general adult psychiatrist with special interest and training in child and adolescent psychiatry, LGBTQ issues, particularly transsexualism. In recognition to the services <laughs> rendered to the transgender community in Sri Lanka, Professor Ginige was awarded a Trophy of Appreciation by the United Nations Programme on HIV and AIDS, the UN AIDS, in October 2016. She delivered the prestigious Seneca Bibile oration at the annual academic sessions of the Candy Society of Medicine in 2022 under the thematic Metamorphosis of Transsexualism. Professor Guinea has conducted extensive research in the fields of childhood mental health disorders, autism, intellectual disability, transgender issues and has contributed to many academic publications which are widely cited. We are privileged to meet you today, Professor Guinea for the video segment of the BCIS International Affairs Review. Um, hello everybody, thank you very much for inviting me to this very important and uh, timely discussion. Thank you, Shaini. You're welcome, Professor. <coughs> uh, Professor, there have been uh, substantial efforts mm -hmm. made by the international community to address the grievances of the transgender community. There have been enormous positive developments in the fields of human rights and international law relating to the protection of sexual orientation and gender identity especially vulnerable groups such as the LGBTQ community. Can you share with us your observation in current rights and recognition related issues faced by the transgender people in Sri Lanka? Hmm. Do you think we are progressing towards achieving their rights? Um, yeah, that's a very good starting question. Thank you. The whole uh, concept of transsexualism is not a very new modern thing I would say when you look at the history of the world in cultures like India in other countries you know there are so many um, literature uh, you know there's history when you go and read there have been this non-binary gender individuals in the in their own cultures however now this concept of lgbtiq uh, comes into more and more light and discussion uh, people tend to be uh, you know inquisitive and uh, they want to know what is happening and some have uh, poor knowledge, some want to know, uh, some have relatively better idea as to what this is. So, I would answer yes to your question. Things are evolving, things are progressing in our country because when compared to the 2003, when in Sri Lanka, in the recorded medical history of Sri Lanka, 2003 is the first time a transsexual individual was registered in a government sector clinic. <coughs> I would like to bring to your notice that is at the teaching hospital Peradinia Sexual Disorders Clinic um, where when I was a first year registrar in training for psychiatry. I met my first ever transsexual individual who came with a request to change their sex. So 
since then, we had very troubled beginnings in Sri Lanka in this field because people were very much not aware. People are not aware of this concept. And so we were we we didn't know. Uh, we never heard this concept of transsexuals or more even LGBTIQ rights those days. I'm talking about 19 to 20 years ago. And uh, never heard, never taught at medical schools or even at postgraduate uh, institutes. But then we start working with these individuals. We started listening to them. Then uh, the medical field, the professionals, particularly in psychiatry, decided, you know, there's a case here. There are human rights issues involved and uh, there have been a lot of progress. Uh, there have been a lot of legal, uh, progress in the legal aspect too, because transsexualism is no longer an illegal thing. Not that it was ever an uh, illegal thing, uh, illegal concept in Sri Lanka. However, uh, we achieved a great milestone in 2016 in relation to transsexualism and their management mainly. Uh, we could uh, have a gender recognition certificate uh, through a official circular by the Ministry of Health in 2016. Shiny one may think it happened overnight or it was an easy task. No. Uh, there were a lot of effort, there were a lot of uh, discussions, collaboration between 16 different right. uh, stakeholders. Wow, very yes. interesting, very interesting. I know. I must stress one of them was the transsexual community of the country. So Ministry of Health, uh, Sri Lanka College of Psychiatrists, that is where I belong, uh, and human rights associations, uh, you know, all the professional, relevant professionals, uh, there were 16 and, and, and mainly activists, uh, NGOs, as well as the local, uh, right. the government bodies. So with the effort and hard work of all those stakeholders, Sri Lanka could achieve GRC, Gender Recognition Certificate in 2016. It comes under the Health Ministry um, circular uh, H1257 if somebody wants to just Google and see, check it up online. So yes, we have come a long way over the last 20, 20 years, yes. I would say, yes. Um, so Professor, based on your experience as mm -hmm. a consultant psychiatrist, mm -hmm. uh, what are the major mental and physical health related risks that transgender individuals confront in Sri Lanka? Yes, there are of course the general common mental physical issues that these individuals also face, of course. But then there are transgender specific mental and physical issues. Um, if I am to start off with the mental conditions they face, it's mainly anxiety and depression related um, conditions where serious conditions such as suicide is also cannot be ignored. Um, when I say that, one may think uh, transgender individuals or uh, particularly very specifically speaking transsexual individuals may, may be suicidal because of their transsexualism. But a lot of research says, uh, proves that most of the anxieties and depressions uh, they, uh, you know, the depression features and anxiety features, not so much so they would comprise a disorder, uh, are due to the lack of access to services 
and lack of inclusiveness and understanding and sometimes probably due to stigma of the society too more than any other inherent reason of being a transsexualist I don't know whether I made myself clear so yeah those are the mental health aspects and the physical aspects could be you know these individuals are on hormones as part and parcel of the treatments for transsexualism yeah. so most of our unfortunately most of our trans I wouldn't say most but a considerable uh, portion of our transsexual community are on self-administered hormones over the counter some of them they achieve hormones because in our country uh, there is a serious deficiency of the necessary hormones uh, and uh, I would say sadly access to the relevant professionals is also a huge problem so some of the trans individuals they tend to go and find their own hormones and they try to just uh, they just take them on their own <coughs> which leads to lots of physical problems so the livers and all the other important organs in the body the particular the muscles the joints you know that can be very detrimental to their physical health so those are in very briefly that is what I can say about the mental and physical ailments this particular community uh, faces. Yes. Uh, Professor did you come across any transgender ind individuals those who have been rejected by their families uh, by their colleagues their mm. friends have you come across any of any <coughs> individuals of that sort? Again unfortunately many that is the rule rather than the exception actually uh, because we have done some research with my research team from Peradenia uh, on the qualitative aspect of lives of uh, these transgender individuals that has come to me at our Peradenia teaching hospital clinic and in the, in the qualitative analysis we have found you know at all weeks at all stages of their life starting from the preschool or even the uh, you know early toddlership um, preschool school then as young adults then at work even after being mature adults you know there's a lot of stigma and discrimination against the trans individuals mainly because of a community doesn't have much of an idea their, their lack of knowledge when you don't know something then you you're frightened of that thing. you think oh my god these what are they doing these they are ruining our culture and uh, you know the traditional, traditional. the traditional um, ill-informed uh, thinking about something that we don't know no. right so because of all these things you know these uh, some individuals well majority I can honestly say majority of trans individuals in our communities are being um, cornered, abused, not only psychologically but physically as well. But physical abuse I must say in our country is very minimal but psychological abuse is high up on the list because very derogatory comments and sometimes parents themselves they harass or they want these children their children to change their pattern of thinking they they think it's a disgrace to their families and in our study we found parents saying you know why didn't you drop dead at the birth itself why are you bringing so much shame on to our family so that's the level of um, abuse or discrimination or stigma that we have in our society, society. yes 
Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Now moving on mm -hmm. to the next question. Mm -hmm. uh, research shows that a lot of transgender <coughs> individuals have experienced hostility from uh, medical professionals and mm -hmm. from medical institutions when yes. gaining access to medical treatment, yes. both mental and physical medical treatment. So in your opinion, what should be done to change the attitudes of these mm. medical professionals mm. towards uh, transgender yes. individuals? That's a very, very important uh, question. Uh, of course, now, although transsexualism is in our books right now, it is not a mental health disorder. So actually WHO has, uh, in 2019, Shaini, they gave the warning to the whole of uh, all the world, hey guys, this is not an illness, this is not a mental health disorder. The concept itself carries so much stigma, inbuilt stigma in it. So mental health carries their own load of stigma. So it will be, uh, I th uh, the WHO decided transgender issues uh, or the transgender individuals should be liberated from this uh, label of mental health disorder yes. attached to them. So they want, they want the countries by 2022 uh, to scrap their transgender men, uh, uh, being considered as a mental health disorder and uh, they wanted the disease classification systems to move on and take it out of the mental uh, uh, um, out of the mental health rubric and put it under another condition right so unfortunately of course uh, came uh, covid and uh, those uh, progressive thinking there is a little um, halt i would say and i'm pretty sure even at that moment things are being discussed in that those lines so that we they will be the world will finally achieve that in short we should start from the very beginning, the, at the grassroots level. Uh, I agree. <coughs> Sometimes, uh, even the doctors and uh, the other healthcare staff can, mainly because of their lack of knowledge, and of course, due to the cultural restraints, they may think. Uh, very negatively or adversely about this population. So we should start teaching these gender issues and the differences in orientations, differences in genders. These are scientific human sciences actually, these are human sciences. So even at the school levels, you have to start teaching in an age-appropriate manner. Um, then, of course, the medical students in the medical faculties at the higher uh, and all the other, you know, higher education institutes, where appropriate, can bring in uh, a little bit of uh, uh, these gender issues and orientation problems and LGBTIQ issues, in short, into their curriculums. While I'm saying that, one has to be very careful not to overdo it. Because in countries, in some countries like USA, there's a lot of criticism against these preschool teachers talking to the preschoolers about the gender issues. And like, um, particularly the teenagers, um, you know, teenagers, can be easily influenced because their brains are not developed fully they are being developed so they are very vulnerable to whatever the uh, concepts and uh, you know in some teenagers particularly the females the girls teen girls they tend to cut themselves and they tend to you know get hurt into themselves, yeah. hurt themselves hurt themselves and in as a social contagion you know sometimes the mass hysteria like I, I, I maybe i should not use that term because it's an outdated but it's like a common social contagion behavior 
contagious behavior where they get into these um, social, uh, you know, get into cliques and they do different things like deliberate self-harms and overdoses and stuff. While they could be the teenagers who really need help, while they may be having mental health issues, some of them get into a fashion of doing those things. So in, in countries like USA, you know, this transgenderism, changing of genderness, their gender has become a fashion. fashion. And there's a, a lot of criticism by anti-trans movements you know, you shouldn't cultivate these um, ideas. You, do, you shouldn't put ideas into the children. But the other side of the coin is, you know, you cannot force a person to be a transgender. It's like inbuilt. A transgender, a true transgender knows it's a true transgender. And people can fake things, of course, for different, different reasons. However, that is where a, a mental health professional who's who's skilled and who's trained who's trained in gender issues is needed to make a proper diagnosis and that diagnosis is not a one clinic visit diagnosis it's a process you work with the patient or, or the client that comes to you and you get that person to live in uh, their real life uh, we, we, you want the trans uh, individual or the individual who claims he's a trans, we see whether the person is living in a preferred gender for a, for, from six months to one year to two years time. And we do a thorough proper assessment. So coming back to your question, I was giving a bit of a preamble to your question. So, to change the attitudes of the doctors or the healthcare professionals, it's important we start giving these concepts in a very careful, cautious manner from the preschool onwards in, a, um, in, the, in the schools, then on to the schools, then the universities, higher education institutes, and then maybe at the workplaces. Because um, at the preschools, you don't have to go and introduce the concept of transsexualism. For example, you can say, you know, you do not, there are people are different and you do not discriminate just because they are different. Because lots of transgender individuals are being harassed as children, as very young children and they are being called names and that leaves permanent scars in the psychology of these trans individuals and they are very damaging. It's very difficult to um, undo that kind of damage, you know, it yes. takes a lot of effort. Yeah. Uh, professor, now can you tell me what type of an attitude uh, do the Sri Lankan youth, the Sri Lankan younger generation have towards transgender surgeries? Mm. Is there a growing uh, enthusiasm among the youth uh, to undergo this, this form of uh, surgeries? Well, according to my experience and uh, um, knowledge, in Sri Lanka, cisgender youth will don't have a tendency to go and get transgender surgeries. But the the younger generation is more aware of this LGBTIQ rights and all because I have come across teenagers who would buy a transgender ring or a transgender uh, jewelry for their gen uh, transgender friend. I mean, when we were at that age, we never heard of these things. Of course, the younger generations are more aware and they are more inclusive of the the differences of the human beings which is a good trend I think that is progressive that is how cultures should evolve uh, just because your mate uh, your friend is different you're not going to like uh, you know corner that person uh, so the surgeries are strictly for the properly diagnosed transgender individuals yes. not anybody can go and get whatever surgery they want 
um, well, there are people who do plastic surgeries yes. for better bodies or features. features. Then that's a different kettle of fish. Yeah, yes. of course. Yes. Moving on to the next question, uh, Professor. Do you have any suggestions on how to improve the medical establishment of the country to improve the conditions of the transgender community? Right. Before answering that, Shiny, I would like to highlight the fact this transsexualism or transgender individuals, I mean, they, those conditions are not uh, mental health disorders because the world is moving uh, beyond this mere uh, medicalization of these gender issues. WHO in 2019 wanted the transsexualism and the related issues to be taken out of the rubric of uh, mental health disorders so that there will be less stigma and more acceptance and um, you know how one individual thinks about their gender is not uh, somebody's mental health disorder and it is not to be diagnosed as such. So we psychiatrists are not gatekeepers of transsexuals. They are with the new classification systems of the world like ICD-10 by WHO and even uh, the American classification system of the world DSM-5. They all are kind of liberating the transsexual community uh, from this uh, mental health stigma and um, all the related adversities. So, how the medical establishments can improve the trans? That is the question, right? Yes, yes, Professor. Okay. About the medical establishment yes. and how they can improve, uh, and also how they can contribute okay. to the well being of the transgender right. community. Okay. So, Yes, so with the background information that we no longer consider this as a mental health disorder, but still they need medical input for the transformation, for the sex reassignment surgeries. So you need a doctor to tell them this is, uh, I mean you need a doctor to help them, not to tell them, but to help them through the process if they are truly transsexuals so in the process i think a very important thing is to get rid of and try and minimize the internal transphobia because some of the transsexual individuals they have stigma within them they have transphobia within them that is more damaging you really need to work with a psychologist or a therapist or a counselor or a supporting friend who's into these subjects you know then um, that person can slowly think differently and be proud of who you are and uh, come out of the internal transphobia and transphobia is not only in sri lanka it's a worldwide thing so people, um, I believe, knowledge and only knowledge can, uh, uh, you know, reduce this stigma. Because as I always say, it's, if you don't know something, then you're, fr you're frightened of it. Because you're frightened of the unknown. You don't know what that unknown would do to your culture, your children, your society. So. There's a lot of stigma, so knowledge will bring down that stigma to a great extent. Because if you know, then you understand. True. So, uh, I think, so we teach medical school students, we teach postgraduates, we train, and we do uh, community programs in educating uh, school teachers and uh, education officers, high authorities. So people should have an open mind. And in Sri Lanka, when compared to our sister countries in the Southeast Asia, you know, we also have joined forces with them. Because Pakistan, I think it's Pakistan that joined uh, the moment of accepting these transgenders legally. They started as earlier as 2009 and uh, Nepal, India, they have uh, 
come up with the legislation uh, of decriminalizing this state. And in, Sri, in a country like Sri Lanka, a country where homosexualism is still considered an illegal offense, uh, of course there are a lot of work being done to make it, uh, uh, to decriminalize uh, homosexualism. Uh, so in a country like that, I'm proud as a person who has been uh, managing transsexual community for about uh, two decades now uh, that we have managed to legalize the concept yes so thank you very much for your thought-provoking insights uh, professor on a topic of uh, contemporary importance uh, so uh, in order to wrap up uh, today's discussion I would like to ask you on your thoughts uh, about the LGBTIQ movements in Sri Lanka mm -hmm. uh, so in your opinion mm -hmm. Uh, do you believe that these movements are capable of safeguarding the rights and privileges of the LGBTIQ community in Sri Lanka? What are your thoughts about this? Yes, we have a very active uh, NGOs and activists in Sri Lanka in safeguarding, uh, representing and advocating the rights and um, uh, the voice of this LGBTIQ community and we have parades, uh, the gay parades, the LGBTIQ parades, the rainbow parade, the rainbow rainbow parade, parade. and people now you know go out in rainbow um, necklaces of course I had a necklace of rainbow colors but it didn't give the go it didn't match with my sorry today so I had to sadly just let go of it so um, yeah, people are very active, um, these organizations, some are very genuine, some are very hard working and um, like in any other field, some organizations uh, may be having hidden agendas, you know, for, for huge sums of grants Money. or anything. And funds maybe. Yes, funds, grants. And uh, well, that is a common thing in any field, not only limited to trans community. So it is very important that people do not abuse um, uh, their activism uh, for their other gains, minor gains, because this is a, this is about the lives of a very of a of a group of people of a sexual minority and it's about their life it's about their future it's about that sexual minorities rights and uh, human rights so it's important yeah they are capable the activist groups and NGOs uh, the movement in LGBT are capable but they can't just like in any other field they themselves can't do this alone everybody the common public the medical health professionals the psychiatrists like um, lawyers human rights associations they all should get together then only uh, the Sri Lankans will have a more wider acceptance less discrimination and uh, less stigma on this issue of LGBTIQ and accepting because uh, you don't realize once one of your own loved ones uh, experience these issues then you will be open-minded you will read you will talk to a relevant uh, content specialists and then you will educate yourself otherwise you will just see some Facebook or social media post and you will say oh my god this what are these people doing they're just ruining our culture no I think um, they are capable, we have to all do it together, no organization can achieve uh, anything uh, alone. So thank you very much uh, <coughs> Professor for taking time off your busy schedule and participating in this discussion. It's my pleasure. Uh, so thank you very much for enlightening the young acad academics, scholars, professionals and international relations enthusiasts on a topic of contemporary importance. 
we really appreciate your participation and your contributions to the field of uh, transsexualism and also for the for your contributions uh, in supporting these individuals so thank you once again thank you for coming all the way from colombo to our beautiful university of peradenia faculty of medicine thank you mm -hmm.